Hey, welcome Hill City to part three of the series on prayer. Part one was all about talking to God. Uh, this is the way we normally practice prayer. And we use the Lord's prayer as the scaffolding to teach us how to pray, right? Because Jesus gave us this kind of skeleton to put together how we pray. And in part two is talking with God. Hannah spoke of prayer as a collaboration and, and, and with gratitude, but also don't forget lament, which it means like honest mourning about things in our lives, pain, despair, sin, a lament of repentance. And we never want to install a Christianity that does not deal with real life. That means dealing with real loss, but also knowing that we have great joy in Christ. But many of us, we have seasons of suffering, so that's hard and we take our sufferings to God. Today, the message is all about the third posture we take towards God, listening to God, listening to God. So let's jump in. Just before the death of Mother Teresa, uh, she made a rare television appearance on 60 Minutes. And I, I believe I remember this appearance. And at one point in the interview, the journalist asked her, when you pray to God, what do you say? And, uh, and, and when she answered, I don't say anything, I listen. Mother Teresa was giving this, uh, this journalist insight about prayer that many followers uh, have not experienced, like stages of child development. In the beginning, you use another person's word and the child begins to talk, copying the other word. Then the child begins to speak their own words. They're cooing, right? And then the, they learn this posture of listening and hearing the, the other's voice. And that's what we do. We're hearing the voice of God with all its nuances and getting familiar with the voice of God. For the disciples of Jesus, we have an innate, like spirit-generated desire to hear God's voice. That's what many people say, I wanna hear God's voice, I wanna know his guidance, his leading. And learning to hear God's voice is the single most important task for the follower of Jesus, right? And if you have your Bibles, please turn to John 10. And Jesus is teaching and, and he is parale uh, par paralleling himself to a shepherd here and his disciple as his sheep. Let's read John 10, two to six. The one who enters by the gates is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. His calling his own sheep by name leads them out. And when he has brought out all of his own, he goes ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger's voice. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand. Uh, you know, it's funny that he's speaking about them in front of them, but they didn't understand what he was telling him them. Jesus is saying his sheep, those who are truly his, will know his voice and follow it. Yes, you and I have a shepherd. Tell your neighbor, you have a shepherd. That's right. And he desires to guide you, protect you, love you, and grow you and lead you. Your shepherd wants to shepherd you, right? Into green pastures, quiet waters, restore your soul, even through the valley of the shadow of death. And this is the reality of walking with our good shepherd. It's interactive, it's dynamic, it's bonding, and it orients us in times of chaos. And we do this by sitting at the feet of Jesus, like Mary did, sitting at the feet, right? It was an expression for discipleship, an expression of I choose to follow your lifestyle, your values, your, 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 uh, your, your principles as your apprentice. And we see this posture in the Old Testament, in, and it's called the Shema, right? And this prayer was central to the faith of the Hebrews. It was the anchor prayer, prayed three times a day, literally written down on scraps of paper, bound to their foreheads, and then uh, pinned up in their doorways. And it was a prayer in their houses. The Shema prayer is found in Deuteronomy 6, and it goes like this. Hear, O Israel, or Shema Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Sound familiar? 
here, right? Right? The first words of the Shema, right? It's hard to translate in English because it has a double meaning. It means first to hear, but secondly, also means to obey. It means both to hear and obey. Like when parents say to their child, hey, listen to me. What they're saying is not just pay attention, but they're saying, do what I ask right? Obey me and it will go well with you. And Jesus is teaching us the same pattern. Hear me, obey me, and it will go well with you. And this is how we walk with God. We hear his voice, we recognize it, and then we obey his voice. But many times we hear, then we walk away and live as if we didn't hear. We live as if God doesn't exist sometimes. But why? Why this chasm? Why is it so hard? Why the great incongruence? Dallas Willard would say that's the difference between profession and belief, right? Profession and belief. Let, let, let me, profession is what we think, but we live out what we believe. And let me keep pushing on this because I need us to like really take this in. Looking to Jesus's great commission as his apprentices, many of us know this in Matthew 20, 9 to 20, it says this, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And I want to ask, is making, going, baptizing, teaching, and obeying on our personal radar? I really want to ask that in our family values? Is it in yours or a uh, 10-year plan? Is it in the 10-year plan or the life vision? For many, it is, I would say. For others, it's entirely missing. And we might have been following Jesus for the last 10 years, five years. But why? Why this, this big break, this big gap between knowing and professing and what we actually do? Ignatius of Loyola would say it would define sin as the want uh, that uh, the unwillingness to trust that God what uh, the unwillingness to trust that what God wants for me is only my deepest happiness. The unwillingness to trust that what God wants for me is only my deepest happiness. That's the definition of sin for him. Now understand the sin part, but don't forget the deepest happiness part. Until we can trust God from the core of our being that God knows and wants for us our deepest happiness and our blessedness, we will not desire to even hear his voice, much less obey it. Take that in. Because this plays right into our fears, and Satan knows it, fears that if I trust God, we won't get what we desire. That God doesn't know or doesn't care about my desires and dreams, which leads me to say, God can't be trusted. I must force my desires and wants. And most of our fears are grounded in that. And yet we must deal with our fears or we will be captive to Satan's schemes. And Paul said it like, I do, I want to do good, but evil's right there within me. And my inner being delights in God's law, God's way. But I see another law, another system in work within me, waging war against the law of my mind, making me a prisoner of the law of sin that works within me. He goes then, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Who? I love how he answers. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's the battle we're in. It's a battle of trust to listen and trust God. But to trust in God, you have to believe that God has the best for you, a life of greatest fulfillment. And if we don't believe that, we will say we, will say we follow him, but we cannot obey him. You still with me? If we are moving forward and trusting God, and I'm not saying that this is a linear process. It doesn't just go this way. It's like, you know, all, all over. It happens in many ways. Here are six ways of hearing God's voice. Number one, it's Jesus, scripture, circumstance, desire, prophetic, and listening prayer. Let's start with Jesus. Jesus is called the word of God in the New Testament, the logos of God. Logos in the Greek is, is it's, uh, transcribed as reason, the word, the speech, the foundational principle of God. Hearing God's voice begins and ends with Jesus as logos, the word, his life, death, resurrection, return, his kingdom. That's the principle we live by. 
to scripture. Some of the Bible's written in this audible voice, such as the Ten Commandments, and Jesus spoke the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, but much of the Bible is God speaking through the minds of human writers, and yet all of it is a way of listening and obeying God. One way to approach scripture that I want us to practice this week or practice going forward, it was developed by monks and who desired to hear God's voice called Latino Divina. Latino Divina. And you do it by first reading scripture, reading the passage, then reading it again slowly and quietly and prayerfully. Just make it short, make it a short passage. Second, ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate a word, a phrase, an idea, and speak to you personally. Reflect how God is speaking to you through the text. And then third, respond by taking it to God in prayer, considering how God might be leading you. And fourth, just pause and listen in silence before the presence of God. Latino, la divina. I want you to try that. Now, the third way God's voice speaks is through circumstances, the opportunities, closed doors, the limitations, the giftings, the relationships, our family history, the situations we find ourselves in. God is often in those circumstances, guiding us forward by his voice. Paula D.R.C. once said, God comes to us disguised by life like as our life, right? God comes to us disguised as our life. Learning to recognize God in life through events and non-events is a key part of learning to hear God's voice. Fourth is our desires. A way we discern God's voice is by listening to both carefully and critically to the desires of our heart. The modern culture tells us, be true to yourself, like follow your heart, right? But this will lead to happiness, but this is at best just a half truth, right? Because the writers of the Bible have a high level of view of desires, that they understand that the heart is complex, but it's full of both beauty and ugly, both light and darkness. Some desires left unchecked will lead us into ruin, but other desires are actually God working in us and through us. Generally, desires is a good indication of design, like God made birds to want to fly and fish to swim. Yet, because of our heart has been infected by sin, we have to filter our desires through the word of God, through the words of God. But overall, desires is one of the ways we hear God's voice. Fifth is prophecy. That's right. God speaks to us through others. Prophecy is not primarily predicting the future or pronouncing judgment, right? Most of what it is the Apostle Paul calls the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. And that's what he talks about in 1 Corinthians 14. God has gifted some people with prophecy. I know some people who are leery uh, due to the abuse of giftings, but there are moments when God wants to speak through a person. Maybe it's tonight for you. Like when I was praying for you, I, I had this thought, or I felt like I was meant to share this verse with you. Then the receiver feels the weight from the Spirit of God, and you sense that it's a word for you. And this is important in the community of God. It's actually needed in the community of God. And sixth is listening prayer. This is simply waiting quietly for God to speak into your minds and the hearts and and allowing the Holy Spirit to guide you in your inner life and and, and think, think about it like in this way. What is communication? Communication is just guided thought. When I say think of a sunset, a sense that appears in your mind. Or uh, don't think of an elephant. What do you think about? You, you're normally in an elephant, right? Your mind is where thoughts are formed, emotions are created, ideas are born. All of life is in our mind, right? Our experienced consciousness. And in 1 Kings 19, Elijah experienced God's voice as a still small voice, not a deafening yell. And that Hebrew phrase can be translated a gentle whisper or a sound of gentle silence. Think of that. I know that silence might be a new 
discipline for many, especially in our loud, busy, noise-polluted world, what C.S. Lewis calls the kingdom of noise. And in all the commotion, it's hard to gain silence. And for some, silence makes us feel like restless and anxious and angry. And maybe that's a warning of the state of our soul. Much of our maturing in our life with God is training to quiet our minds and body before God to sit at his feet and wait on his voice. Blaise Pascal wrote, all of humanity's problems stem from a man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. And in that silence, God is speaking loudly. But this is going to take practice. But think of how necessary it is for us today to hear the voice of God, to listen, to obey because we trust that he is good and he cares for us and God knows our greatest desires. In closing, you are not alone in this. We can, we can do this in community, in house churches, in groups, to mature in hearing and discerning God's voice. Now, how do we grow in the ability of discerning Jesus' voice from all the other voices we hear? The same way we learn to discern voices of our best friends, our spouse, of our children, our parents, by practicing moments of listening, periods of listening, our brains come to recognize almost immediately a person's voice. This is the exercise this week. Remember, you're in Jesus training. You are in Jesus training as his disciples forming into his image. First, I want you to practice Latino Divina, right? You can do it alone. You can do it together. Find a prayer partner or triad. Do it. Make it happen. And number two, practice listening prayer. Find a quiet place to be silent, asking God to speak. This is going to take trust and a surrendered heart, that's right, and endurance. After all, why would God speak to us if we are not going to heed his voice? So we must surrender and trust him. And we must say yes to Jesus' invitation to himself when he says, come to me. And I end with this. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray for all those who are listening to this message, that when they are shamaing this message to to hear, but also to obey, to make intent to obey, to take a step in obedience, Lord God. I pray this week as we practice listening prayer, we practice Latino Divino, that you would be with us ever so present, And let us hear and discern your voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.